All right, well, welcome everyone. We're glad to have you here. Go, Maya. Thanks so much for joining. Um, this is our second installment of our virtual block parties. Um, and this is a collaboration with Long Beach Water and the California Native Plant Society. So this is also being recorded for folks that, you know, if you wanna come back and listen to this, we have the recording of the first one as well, if you're interested. And this, this talk is really focused on diving deeper into maintenance and establishing your native plant parkway. Yeah, so this is episode two, Digging Deeper. So we're gonna go into introductions of ourselves and um, just the organizations that we're working for and the benefits of planting natives. And then we're gonna dive into sheet mulching as a way of removing your lawn. Um, and then we're gonna talk about pruning techniques and specifically pruning with native plants and the native plants that are featured in the Parkway program. Um, and then we're gonna have space for a question for Q and A. So be great if you could save your questions for the end. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. All right, so uh, these are the people of the Long Beach Water Department running the Parkway program. We have our program manager, James. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it today, but I'm here, I'm Tina Fan, and we have Larissa here as well. And we are the water conservation assistants here at the Long Beach Water Department. Next slide, please. And I'm Anne-Marie Benz. I'm with California Native Plant Society. I'm in the horticulture program. And I'm Mar Maya Argamon, and I am also with the horticulture program, and I am the program coordinator at CNPS. So the California Native Plant Society's mission is dedicated to conserving native plants in their natural habitats and increasing the understanding, appreciation, and general horticultural use of native plants in California. And our work is really diverse because it's trying to blend science and conservation and research along with gardening and education and outreach and trying to bring native plants in the forefront of our built environments. And our motto is that, you know, we can restore nature one garden at a time and that we really truly believe that our built environments and our built landscapes can truly change the world. So we can really restore nature one garden at a time and just planting one native plant in your garden or urban environment or suburban space can truly make a difference. Before we get into the specifics of the workshop, I'd like to provide some background information on the Long Beach Water Department and quickly go over the details of our Parkway program. So to start off, the Long Beach Water Department is a municipally owned water and sewer utility that provides service to almost half a million customers in a 50 square mile service area. A fun fact we like to share is that we have 1,600 miles of water and sewer pipelines. So if you lay them out end to end, it would go from here in Long Beach all the way to Houston, Texas. And we are fortunate to have a very supportive board of water commissioners, management team, and customer base to whom we provide service to 24-7, 365 days a year. And we pride ourselves on being a recognized leader in water conservation and innovation. Next slide. So early last year, we launched our native plant parkway program. For those of you unfamiliar with the term parkway, it is the grass median area between the sidewalk and curbside found in many neighborhoods here in Long Beach. And the parkway program is a voucher based program where we offer pre-designed kits of California native plants, mulch and pavers. Participants can choose from five different pallets of plants, which are redeemable at two local nurseries, and our mulch and pavers come from a local landscape supply store. The parkway kits are fully funded by the Long Beach Water Department, so participants only have to incur the cost of removing their turf and installing the materials. 
This can be a DIY project by yourself with friends and family, or you can ask your gardener to help out. Next slide, please. To be eligible for this program, your parkway must have living turf grass at the time that you apply. If the grass is dead or has already been removed or it's just looking sparse, um, the application may still be approved at the discretion of our program manager if the applicant is able to provide recent photos of the area with living grass. We would love to approve as many people as possible, but we do have a limited budget and this would be on a case by case basis. And the participant cannot combine the Parkway program voucher with any other incentives that we offer here at Long Beach, such as the Lanta Garden program for the same project area. However, if you want to do the Parkway program for your Parkway and Lanta Garden for your front yard, that is totally acceptable. Next slide, please. So by participating in our program, you are required to maintain the parkway for a minimum of five years. Of course, we hope you will enjoy your parkway for many more years to come after that. But, and so anyway, the Long Beach Water Department may ask the participant to reimburse the value of the project if we find that the parkway has been significantly altered from the approved design or otherwise improperly maintained, such as reintroducing turf grass. And that's kind of why we're here presenting to you on how to take care of your plants so that you won't have to um, go through this reimbursement process. And so the amount of reimbursement required depends on when the non-compliance occurs. So within the first year of installation, that would be 100% of the costs of the plants and materials. Within the second year, it would be 80% and it would decrease so on by 20% to the fifth year. Next slide. Finally, here's an outline of the entire process for those of you who are interested in participating. So first, you apply online at lbwater.org parkway, and our team will send you our parkway program guidebook, which lists all the details of the different plants and has tips on how to remove your turf and everything like that. And then after that, we will go out to inspect your parkway site and measure the square footage so that we can calculate how many plants and how much mulch and stepping stones you would need. So after you look through their guidebook, you can choose which of the five plan of plants that you want to receive. And our team will let you know when your application is approved and when you can start removing your turf grass. So once you've removed your grass, uh, let us know and we will schedule your mulch and stone delivery and contact the nursery to prepare your plants. It might take a few, few days for the nursery to order your plants, but we'll inform you when they are ready for pickup and then you can go ahead and plant them in your parkway. Then when your parkway project is complete, we ask that you please notify us so that we can go and check it out and maybe snap a few photos. And the last step here, which says display your free native plants live here sign in your parkway. We actually at this time don't have these signs, but we are working on getting those produced as soon as possible. And we will be contacting all our participants when those are available. And with that, I'm handing off the presentation to CNPS to teach you about how to take care of your California native plants. Thanks so much, Tina. That was a great overview of the program and all the work that you all do. Thanks so much. And I'm, I'm just going to say the parkway designs are really creative and fun. So I think that's a fun part of the project is being able to choose the, the plants you want and the design for your parkway. Um, that being said, I'm going to just talk about some of the, just a general overview of the, of the benefits of having native plants in your garden. Um, so not only are they incredibly beautiful and easy to maintain, but they provide a lot of benefits for local pollinators and wildlife. Many native bees and butterflies rely on native plants for their habitat and their source of um, nectar. And there a lot of native pollinators have co-evolved with native plants as well. So you can't have one without the other and having native plants provides these essential habitat um, for pollinators and wildlife alike. Another big reason to have native plants in your garden is water conservation. So once your native plants are established, they require really small amounts of irrigation beyond uh, normal rainfall that you experience in a year. Um, and, you know, saving water 
conserves obviously this really vital and limited resource that we have, but it also saves you money. So that's something to also consider. Um, and like I mentioned, native plants require much less maintenance overall than your non-native counterparts. Um, they really significantly require less time and resources than traditional turf dominated landscapes, especially like no mowing of your lawn or adding fertilizers or anything like that when it comes to native plants. Um, and that goes along with the reduced runoff and pollution. So with native plants, you can really skip all the harmful pesticides and insecticides. Um, you know, they have really developed their own defenses against many of the pests and diseases that are common with other non-native plants. Um, so less usage of pesticides means less runoff into our greater environment um, and our waterways. And lastly, you know, native plants really do create a great sense of place and a connection to nature that you couldn't experience with a lawn. Um, you know, having native plants encompasses the natural beauty of California and allows you to connect with, you know, the wilderness that we have left in California in your very own space. So native plants really provide that sense of place that you couldn't have with a lawn. Um, next slide, please. So um, that being said, we're going to talk about sheet mulching as a very simple and effective method of removing existing turf or lawn in your space. Um, Anne-Marie, do you want to talk about this or I can jump in also? Um, Why don't we both talk about it a little bit? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of different ways to replace your lawn or to remove soil or saw, I mean, grasses of various kinds. And you can kill them off in various ways. You can dig them out. Um, and there, there are reasons to do various ones, but sheet mulching either on its own or in addition to those will help to not only remove the grasses, but it will help to feed the soils underneath them and therefore give you a little bit of a boost, a better opportunity for, um, for having a, a good parkway experience. So sheet mulching is a lot like uh, a lasagna recipe. You know, everyone has their own layering, but pretty much as long as you have the basic ingredients and you keep layering them over each other, you're going to be okay. So with sheet mulching, if you have something, if you have already grass or you have things in there, you want to cut them back as much as possible. You want to kind of do a little ditch right around the edge, not much, just, you know, just a little bit of a divot kind of thing. And then you end up basically doing these layers. It's a matter of taking cardboard. You can either, you know, during COVID, way too many of us are probably ordering way too many boxes. Um, I've got that problem here. So I'm hoping everybody else is in a similar position and can use these for sheet mulching. You can also buy what's called um, B-roll. It is a fluted cardboard roll that you can roll out. So basically you're gonna take cardboard and wet it and then layer on compost and cardboard and compost depending on what you have and you're going to top it with a layer of mulch. Um, you can use thick layers of newspaper as well um, and really what you want is something that will starve out the light beneath it. Um, all of these layers will kind of eventually dissolve in and they will compost down and become part of the soil and help to feed the soil. So it's really good for your plants in that way. It's fairly easy. And then that divot that you put in around the edge, the little bit of a trench, is just to kind of roll the cardboard under the edge and it makes it a little bit neater and it also um, makes sure it goes right to the edge. Because a lot of times when you're taking out uh, sod or grasses, the hardest part to get is that area right along the edges of your sidewalk or your walkway or the different corners. So it, you can choose to remove your soil in other ways um, and then use sheet mulching in addition to it, or you can go straight to sheet mulching. And with sheet mulching, you can go around large plants that are already there, or with smaller ones, you can plant directly into the sheet mulching lasagna setup. And also something to add, it's 
really important to keep everything moist as you're going, um, like water once a week if you're not, if you're in the rainy season as well. Oh, I guess you're talking about that on the next slide. Never mind. Well, I be do that. <laughs> no, no, that's part of it. Keeping it yeah. moist will help it to break down and will help yeah. it to, you know, to become good feed for your soil. Um, topping it with mulch will help to keep the sun from baking it and leaving areas if you're, especially if you're doing large sections of a yard, uh, leaving a few areas that don't have mulch or things on top where there is access to bare soil will help for pollinators. That was one of on the pros and cons sheet, one of the ways that um, you can help support pollinators. Uh, California has 1600 types of native bees. Very few of them are the honeybee that we all think of. The, that live in, you know, Winnie the Pooh style uh, beehives. Instead, the vast majority are native ground dwelling bees. And so finding little bits of bare soil gives them a boost as they're coming through your region. And Long Beach has a, you know, a lot of pieces to offer, but the more we can all add in to protect our pollinators, the better it is for everyone. So putting all these lasagna layers together is a really good way to sheet mulch everything from small pieces like a parkway to we've done entire parks as they're changing over their landscapes before. So it can go with all different sizes. And you can even keep little bits of cardboard around and mulch and just if something starts popping up that you don't want, you just kind of pop it right on top and patchwork it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, and just to really encourage the use of sheet mulching, you know, it's really a great way to go because it just, it also improves your soil structure and increases plant health and there's no gas emissions. You don't have to haul all the green waste of the, you know, the turf that you're removing. It can be done any time of year. It just requires a little bit of planning because it is a little bit more time consuming, but Overall, it's really a simple and effective way to go. And it sounds like Tina also said that the Long Beach Water Department has free cardboard available for pickup. So that's great. You can just pick up the cardboard, which is like the weed barrier aspect of it. And you're pretty much good to go almost. You just need some mulch and some compost and time. All it is is time also. So it's great. And this is um, a lot less backbreaking version of pulling it out. Lawn is heavy, <laughs> so. Yeah, and the whole thing where it increases, you know, your soil structure and adds to your soil is great. And then it just, it makes a lot of sense. So we're all about sheep mulching here. <laughs> all about um, getting the best return for your investment. So the, the, be the biggest bang with the less work, least work. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so now we're gonna talk about pruning and, you know, what exactly are we pruning and why and when and just different techniques that we recommend for pruning. Um, so generally pruning isn't really required for the health of your tree or shrub or perennial. Um, and native plants in general require really minimal amounts of pruning as long as the garden is designed well and you spaced your plants properly. Um, just to ensure that you know they have room to grow. Um, and another key aspect is you don't want to remove more than 25% of the foliage or like the plant at a time. Um, that being said, do you want to go to the next slide? Well, oh, pruning, I think yeah, we're gonna, we let them know that with pruning, we're going to cover a lot of different ways. We often, when we say pruning, we mean just cutting back a plant. It's not quite what pruning itself means, but in often that's how it's used. And so with pruning, we are both making it look how you want, keeping it in the confines of your space, and also kind of like mimicking nature a little bit. So when you go into prune, think about, are you a bunny or are you a deer? Are you coming in and grazing off the top? Are you just nibbling back a little bit around the edges? They're, they're kind of nature's pruners. So when you're doing that, sometimes we're going for a particular look and sometimes we're just kind of getting it back a little bit like nature would. Yes, yeah, thanks for adding that. Um, yeah, pruning is truly a science and an art form. Like you can really, especially when your garden matures over time, you can really 
have pruning be like a creative, artful technique to your space and you can really transform your plants in a beautiful way. Um, that being said, you know, it can be the other way around where I've definitely seen a lot of landscapes where they just really hack at the tree or the shrub. So um, there's definitely a balance to it um, when it comes to pruning. And um, yeah, basically over time, you know, your garden's appearance can really improve dramatically with pruning as long as you pay attention to how and why exactly you're pruning. Um, We'll go through a couple different ways you can do that. Yes. So when to prune? Um, overall, um, very little pruning is required during the first year of establishment, especially with native plants. Um, but there are some fast growing plants um, that do require a little bit of pruning after flowering within the first year just to provide shape. Um, and I guess, yeah, I don't really feel like reading this entire slide, but um, a lot of the woody subshrubs like the sages and the salvias that are within your um, project, the buckwheats and some of the, the coastal seaside daisy can benefit from annual pruning at the beginning of the fall season. Um, and like grasses that we have in this program need a hard prune right in the winter, right before their spring growth reappears. Um, so they have different, and in general, you know, after the bloom period is the best time to prune. So deadheading, um, this is a beautiful picture of a yarrow or Achillea millifolium, which is offered in your, um, one of your plant uh, designs. Um, and this is a wonderful example of what you can deadhead. And it's kind of just what it sounds like. Deadheading is removing the spent or dead flowers within your shrub or perennial or annual. Um, and it, it kind of refreshes the plant and can provide more flowers. So um, it encourages healthy growth and fresh flowers throughout that growing blooming season that you have. Um, and, and you can do it not only with yarrow, you can do it with really any flowering plant that you have, like um, the seaside daisy, the ridgeron could be good, maybe some of the flowering ceanothus. Um, those are good examples. Um, and you can kind of think about it as like a deer would browse, you know, maybe this is more of the deer approach. Um, they want to eat off the flowers, so yeah. And it's, a and way it's when, also though, oh, sorry to interrupt. Say, but, when you have the little dead flowers, it's kind of just pulling those pieces off. Yes. We have a few for habitat value, but it kind of neatens it up and helps them to put their energy into new flowers, right? Yes, that's what I was going to say also, is that you could leave some for the birds, um, you know, to collect seeds from as well. And also for yourself, if you want to keep some of the spent flowers and harvest the seed for the future too. And it, it allows for, you know, reseeding and then next year the yarrow will come back even fuller. And so, yeah, it's good to keep some on there. Um, cutting back is generally referred to grasses. Um, and like I said, you know, it's good to cut back before the spring growth for grasses and you can really be aggressive with it. Like you can cut all the way down to the to the ground. I mean, not completely, but you know, it's also a great way to clean up the grass also, because um, some of some native grasses, you know, they have the the brown growth that doesn't look great in the winter. So it just it's good to just clean it up before the spring. Um, yeah, do you have it's a way else? to do it instead of kind of mowing the native grasses. You can literally just cut them back. Yeah, like I literally just take my bunch grass and kind of just, it's hard. I wish this was in person because I could show you, but you kind of hold it up and then you take, I literally just take scissors and just cut it through and you give it a nice haircut. So you just kind of grab the entire bunch and then you just, you can be more artful about it, but that's kind of, you're just giving it a haircut. You're just kind of buzzing it all off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and edging's got to be really important down there. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there's a slide. Great. Yeah, so edging is definitely important, especially with a parkway where you have people walking and it's more of a public space. Um, so 
So this is a beautiful picture of some salvia clevelandia, I think. Um, and salvias are included in your parkway project as well. Um, so this is great for, yeah, like I said, your salvias, your buckwheats, your ceanothus, um, even your kind of um, shrub, not as shrubby manzanita. Um, it's good to just cut back the stems um, and it can, you can also kind of be artful about it to make it more of a natural appearance, um, kind of like you can cut them unevenly within the main body of the plant. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, it's good to do the pruning, you know, at the beginning of the fall season. Um, but like with, with all of this, it's okay. You don't have to really be strict about the, the timeline. If, you know, if you notice that it's, the, your salvia is kind of too much in the on the edge you know you can totally prune it back um, it'll be fine as long as you like I said earlier 10 to 25 percent maximum I would say like 20 at the most um, 10 to yeah you don't want to prune more than 10 to 20 percent of the plant just well, too much you, stress on it when you can if the you don't want to just take it and go straight across yeah. These don't grow that way as much. You kind of want to take them to where there is often like a, a branching piece. You know, when you see us put up the pruning, there's always a branching piece that people are cutting. And when there is, you want to go kind of as close to that as you can. Um, and you want to, you know, this is the, a little bit of being a deer again, kind of nibbling around the edges keep it a little bit more natural looking and giving it space to grow rather than just going straight along the sidewalk line. Yeah, I think also just in general with pruning, it's really important to take your time and it's, it's a really meditative thing. Like you really think about, okay, like why am I cutting this part of the plant back? Like, is there another angle I should take or should I take this stem instead? Like, it's really good to take the time to think about your intention with pruning and, um, just it's a meditative thing as well because you don't want to cut back too much also so there's a fine line with it I guess. And Maya's got a, tr uh, a saying that she uses a lot when she talks about planting is that the best thing that you can put on your garden is your shadow. Yes I love that saying. <laughs> and I think it, it works on this as well even with the pruning knowing you know getting to really get hands on and know your garden. Mm -hmm. And this is the one where you get to be a bunny. Yes, the thinning and the lifting. Yes. Um, and this is a beautiful picture of an areogonum, a buckwheat that is also offered um, in the Parkway program. Um, and I think this is a great, thinning and lifting is great for manzanitas as well, which have that beautiful bright bark. So any other woody perennial that, you know, the structure of the bark or the structure of the woody part of the plant is like a highlight of the plant. Um, thinning and lifting is a great way of enhancing that. Um, so basically as your woody shrubs mature, you can expose these beautiful stems and bark um, by lifting up the canopies and which essentially means you're pruning the lower branches and thinning out the center of the plant. Um, so, and this can work for your areogonum too when it's more mature and has more structure to it as well. Um, kind of a way of getting in underneath it and kind of in it and just kind of pulling out the pieces that are starting to look a little, a little overdone, a little scraggly mm -hmm. and giving yeah. it a little more space. Exactly. And this works also with your ceanothus and your toyon and your lemonade berry. And like I said, your larger buckwheats. I know the plants I just listed aren't all featured in this program design, but these are all very um, foundational keystone native plants that you see in a lot of um, people's spaces. Um, so this applies not only for native plants, really any more just a woodier shrub or perennial. And this buckwheat is beautiful. Yeah. The color is amazing. And, you know, butterflies really love buckwheat, so do bees. So it's a great addition also to support your pollinators. Yeah. Good way to have a butterfly garden. Yeah, definitely. 
And these ones are just so happy looking. Yeah, yeah. So these are the Ridgerons um, or Seaside Daisy. And this is also featured in the Parkway program. Um, and pinching is, I think, really similar to deadheading. It's just kind of a different method, but the, the Ridgeron is also a great deadheading um, plant or candidate for deadheading as well. Um, and the pinching is before they're dead, right? So it, it's yeah. to, to open it up and give it a chance to grow bigger and fuller. Yes, exactly. And it's good for most younger plants, um, most younger annuals, mostly and perennials as well. So this could be a good method for um, when your garden isn't fully mature yet. Um, yeah, this is a good method. Coppicing is kind of the one that doesn't hold to the rule that you've put out there about only cut back 10 to 20%. Yeah. Yeah, this is good for, you know, your really woody sub shrubs, like your larger sages or salvias, your larger buckwheats. Um, these will all benefit from the, you know, pruning. This is a, yeah, this is a little bit more heavy duty. If something has gone really wrong with your woody plants and you kind of need them to start over, you need to give them a reason. You, this is what you do when you cut them all the way back. Um, it's not something you normally will probably need to do with your parkways, but you're also on a parkway, which means you're on the edge of a street, which means you have a lot of opportunity for big things to happen. Um, somebody could, you know, park up on the edge of the parkway or run it over, or somebody could, you know, all these different things that could happen to it. If it gets to that point, Coppicing is the term you want to look up to show you how to really cut it all the way back um, or give us a holler about it and we can walk you through it, but it helps to reinvigorate plants that have gotten big and old and woody also kind of to bring them back and you're if you've got a parkway it's relatively new, but 10 years from now, you want it to be to look fresh and clean, there might be times where this is something that you want to do or if you're working on the native plants through the rest of your yard, through your lawn replacement piece, when they get to that age, this is something to do if, they've, if they really need a reset, if it's just that, if it's gotten to that point. Um, often you don't need to, but it's worth knowing about. Mm -hmm. And there's gonna be a soil mo moisture giveaway it looks like we have a poll we're gonna ask you to participate in. And then at the end, we will give away a soil moisture sensor from Long Beach Water Department. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the poll. Yes, yeah, so anyone who would like to participate in the polls, we have two, um, go ahead and answer them to the best of your abilities. And we'll pick one winner, whoever answers at random to be presented at the end. Um, and they will receive right. a soil moisture giveaway, which is perfect uh, for uh, the parkway program. Great. Well, we have a couple of people who've answered. If you're on screen and can go ahead and answer, we'll throw you into the um, soil moisture giveaway, and it'll get us a little bit more understanding of what we can do to help support and what Long Beach Water just can do as well. All right, we'll give it just another moment and then we will end polling. All right, and we'll give it 10 seconds. We've got a couple people who haven't participated yet and moment. All right, so we'll take a look at whether we there should be more how to videos, workshops, more information in the guidebook or more online resources for all of you. So we will end polling. Uh, looks like main result is how to videos and online resources. So we will take a look at all of those pieces. And we will at the very end have an 
soil moisture sensor for, for one of you. Great. All right, let's talk water. This is a big one. Um, so we categorize this by, yeah, just chronologically, as you can all see. Um, it's really important, I like to say, water like nature. So you really want to water deeply and mimic, um, you know, nature's natural cycle. And native plants have generally been evolved to withstand, you know, drier summers and rainier winters. So your watering should, um, you know, take that into account. Um, it definitely still needs water in the winter. Like just because you have a little bit of rain here and there doesn't mean that you don't water. It's definitely important to continue to water, especially in the first 18 months um, while the plant is still being established. Well, and I think there's a miss conception a lot of times with these types of gardens that they are a no water garden and eventually they become an almost no water garden. But to get them established, you want to give them some water and particularly if it's a super dry year or if you plant it in the summer, you want to give them some time to, to grow into adapting to the soil right there where you are. They're adapted to the region, but they might be being uh, planted at a time that they normally wouldn't have, you know, sprung up on their own. So we're giving them, by doing this, we're giving them a chance to, to grow into the fullness and then, then they become a very low water. And when you get to that point, then you have this. Going for deeper soaks, you know, you want watering less frequently and a little bit deeper. What you want is for the roots to get down and deep into the ground where they can get to as much, you know, shallow groundwater as possible. Yeah, and it's something to note that what you're really watering is the soil around the plants that they can take up, you know, like how just trying to mimic rainfall in that way. Um, so that's just something also to note. Um, yeah, so keeping it like watering close to the plant, but not necessarily drenching the plant, kind of watering yeah. the soil around it. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, from my understanding, Long Beach has more clay-like soil. So, you know, there's really high rates of water retention. So I think later, you know, when the plant is more established, you really don't need to water all that much like a deep soak once a month is enough um, and but also you know really check check the soil and understand you know um, you know it may be a drainage test also like checking for soil compaction and all of that is important as well yeah what you don't want to do or avoid as much as possible is anything that will flood it and flood particularly flood your mulch off into the parkway off of the parkway into the street or onto the sidewalk um, and that that can be a problem if you know if you have watering set out there um, but if you're if you're doing it just to establishment once it's established it, it's very rare except for in the years where we have a lot of drought and if you've lived in Long Beach very long you know that that happens every few years So like Maya said, you're trying to water like nature. Yeah, um, and you know, it's also good to uh, check your soil and you may need to dig a few inches down the root zone of the plant to check, check the moisture and see how, you know, if you might need to adjust your watering. Um, but also a really important thing is to check the weather, like, you know, water, especially during heat waves, um, early in the morning is best. Um, and it's great if you can plan your planting around, you know, in the fall or early winter when rainfall is more typically common. Um, but I think checking the weather is, is definitely a very important aspect to this as well. 
Yeah, and uh, when you do water, you want to do it really early in the morning or later at night around the city regulations, but also because the sun can, in the middle of the day can use kind of the raindrops and kind of magnify onto it. The plants aren't gonna get nearly the benefit that they would get if, if it wasn't direct in the middle of the sun, it wasn't yeah. during the day. Early morning is best, but uh, in the evening too works as well. Yeah, some of us are just not early morning people. I know. That's a good motivator for me though, to get out of bed. I'm like, gotta water the plants. <laughs> also, we didn't really go over this, but generally hand watering is, is best, especially with a small space like a parkway. Um, I think hand watering is the recommended way to go with irrigation um, in this instance and with native plants too. Like just try to mimic nature and, and rainfall. It's nice to have one of those nice, um, Hand watering, what's it called? I don't even know. Watering cans that have like the shower effect. Those are kind of nice. Or just, you know, just a deep soak with a hose too. Totally works, especially in the beginning. Yeah. And hand watering is the best way to keep your shadow on the on your garden. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for going over those watering tips. And um, here at Long Beach Water Department, we do have some watering rules in place that I'll just quickly go over just so you're aware. Right now, during the cooler months from October to March, watering is only allowed on Tuesdays and Saturdays. And when it gets warmer from April to September, our watering days are Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And watering is only allowed before 9 a.m. or after 4 p.m. And we ask that you water no more than 10 minutes per station per watering day or 20 minutes if you're using water efficient rotating nozzles. And watering is also prohibited during or within 48 hours of rainfall. And also your plants probably don't need that much water if it is raining. So that, that would be best to avoid. And finally, please avoid watering practices that result in runoff that could flow into neighboring properties. Next slide. All right, so we are having our second poll uh, regarding the soil moisture giveaway. Um, so we're gonna pull that up on the screen in a minute. So just make sure to answer the poll for your chance to win a soil moisture sensor. And thank you so much for your participation. This helps us make improvements to the program. Right, um, sorry to have to say this, but my computer has decided it is locked at the moment and I can't get the poll to start, I'm sorry. You wanna make um, a post and I can try to do it. It's not a Zoom meeting without some technical difficulties, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> it's decided it has a couple of, of special moves at the moment. I'm gonna see if I can if I can move of hosting over to you. Okay, great. Um, I think you just go to right. those, those three buttons or the three dots. Yeah. You know, it would be more fun in person for a variety of reasons. This or feel free, feel free to just type your answers in the chat if you're comfortable with that. That might be the best way to do it. And we are going to open uh, the workshop up to Q&A in just a moment. So if anyone has any questions, save those and you can enter those into the Q&A. Um, since we have kind of a relatively small workshop, uh, we should be able to get to everyone's questions um, before our time is up today. So we wanna make sure that we're answering your questions. Um, so think, keep them coming and um, we'll, we'll get to that mo in just a moment. Looks like people want more videos. <laughs> yeah, definitely some like uh, in-person examples of showing the plants and how we install them or how we prune them would be super helpful. We just gotta get those recorded. That's something we can all work on and do. If, uh... 
getting out and actually it, this is part of what would make it so much more fun in person. Yeah. Um, we can mimic that and get more videos on how to do some of these pruning pieces. Um, they take a bit of time, so they will probably be individual pieces then. All right, are we ready to move to Q&A then? Oh, yes, let's move to Q&A. But first, uh, let me thank everyone so much for um, participating in this event. Um, so we are able to give away two soil, mo soil moisture sensors uh, for this workshop. So I want to thank Jill and Philip for participating in our polls. They were our two selected winners at random. Jill and Philip, I will contact you after the workshop to get in touch with you about how I can drop those off. So thank you to Jill and Philip and thank you to everyone else for participating in the workshop. We're so happy to have you. This is our second one in the series and we hope to have one more at least. Um, and that's going to be with a special guest, part of the um, uh, California Native Plant Society, Long Beach local chapter, um, Chris Sarabia. So we'll hope to see you there as well. And now we're going to open up the floor to uh, Q&A. All right. And it looks like we have our first question uh, from JP. Can we explain pinching and how it's done on the seaside daisies? It is almost too easy because it's exactly what it sounds like. It um, it's going up behind the head of the flower and literally kind of pinching it off or going back to where there's a little bit of a sprouting piece and just kind of pinching and pulling off that, that section of it. Um, usually it, it literally can be just with your fingers kind of pinching and removing it and that'll help it to kind of get a little bit stronger and grow a little bit harder. Um, and then we have a great question from Ramona with um, what is the best spacing with planting natives? Can they touch or is it best to keep them separated? Um, so with um, planting natives, it's really important to plant as if they're already at maturity. Um, so yeah, you do want to give some space because it takes about three years for plants to reach like full maturity, if not, and then they'll probably keep growing after that as well. As, I mean, you can also prune them back as much as you want, of course. Um, but it's important to consider them at maturity. So you can use Cowscape or um, any other nursery resource really and look up the maturity height or and width. The width is important and height too, but just the width of the plant. So if it says that the salvia is gonna be three feet wide, plant them three feet apart, so. It looks a little sad the first year, but it'll fill in really quickly. And before you know it, it's gonna be nice and full and plenty of vegetation. And it's really tempting when you see them and they're tiny plants and you see that it's going to be three feet wide to just go, you know what? I can just like smash them all in there and it'll look really good now. Um, and we caution you against that because it can, it, Although it looks really good at that moment, as they grow, they kind of crowd each other and it ends up being more work because you have to pull some of them out. Yeah, um, it's definitely and, easier. To, it's better to plant farther apart initially and then you can always fill in with more plants as opposed to planting them closer in the beginning and then you have to go back and, you know, like Anne-Marie was saying, remove some of them, so. I believe all of the parkways have plant setups and they can be scaled but they give you kind of an idea of some of the spacing in there as well. Um, and depending on you know, the size of your parkway, you may want to expand or kind of compress that and work with the spacing of the plants. So it's, not, it's something nice to check on each Hi. of them. Right, so we are um, designs that we have on the parkway guidebook are set for 10 feet. So for example, if you have a parkway that's 40 feet and you order a plant, you'll get four times the amount of plants for that 10 feet plan and you just repeat the design over to the stretch of your parkway. Something um, 
Oh, something else to keep in mind is the amount of uh, shade versus sun that your parkway is going to get. Um, so we do have one kit that uh, anticipates shade for or, or plants that uh, will do well in shade. However, if your parkway is maybe half shade, half sun, um, you can let us know and we can give you either like half and half or we can split it up in a way to make sure that your shade plants are are staying in the shade and your sun plants are staying in the sun um, and making sure that your shade plants aren't getting too much sun because they really do perform better in the shade and with a little bit more water. So um, we uh, offer flexibility with our plans and as well as the layout, it doesn't have to be exactly as the kits come. However, uh, that's just kind of a way to uh, it's just a jumping off point for how uh, the plant layout will go. Um, you can have some creativity um, as long as you're maintaining uh, Long Beach City Code, which is to keep an 18 inch clear strip that is parallel to the street. Which is a perfect reason to feel up to, you know, edging it a little bit and making sure you have that 18 inches. Um, should yeah. you add, when should you add more mulch? Uh, mulch is kind of on an as needed basis. Um, you can go out and check it, see how deep it is, you know, but a lot of it is on, is it starting to look, look uneven? Is it, are you starting to see bare ground coming through? Um, those are kind of your indicators that it's time to add more mulch. The mulch will keep the sun from baking the soil. It'll keep the, the water, you know, in the soil with your plants. It'll keep it from um, you know, drying out too quick. So it's great for the plants, but you also um, are gauging on kind of that it, it's looking the way you want it to look. So go out and just, you know, kind of pull it back, take a look, see how deep it is. If you've gotten down, if you started with three inches and you're down to all of a sudden, you know, a half an inch or you know, even just, you know, an inch, inch and a half, you may want to add just a little bit more over it. Yeah, and the Office of Sustainability offers free mulch. We have a mulch pile that you're welcome to go in anytime to pick up mulch for yourself. There's also deliveries, but I hear there's a long wait list for that. And also, um, if we notice grass going back, is it recommended to just put mulch on top of that area? If you've noticed grass growing back, you, it's better even if you can sheet mulch it just a little bit. If there's enough space, pull back some of the mulch that's kind of around there, throw down a little bit of cardboard and then cover it all with mulch. Make sure that there's mulch over where the grass was and so it evens back out to the areas around it. Um, you can use sheet mulching as kind of a patch to, to take care of grass like that. If, there, if something starts to grow in that you don't want and you've pulled it out, um, you can just you know put a little piece over it and then add the mulches back. Um, and if you traditionally had in your grasses a bunch of other kinds of um, some of the tougher grasses to get rid of, even if you've pulled them out for a little while, you might need to keep doing that. If you had some of the crab grasses or some of the things that are harder to get rid of. Um, I'm currently using it to get rid of a spot of ivy that crawled over from a neighbor's place and it's going to take a few rounds of it. But if you have something like that coming from other areas, feel free to like keep mulching over it until you feel good about where it's at. If you are finding that you need some additional mulch and you don't want to uh, go down to the free mulch site here in Long Beach, um, a, something that you can do is uh, use some of your yard waste. Currently, Long Beach does not have a separate uh, pickup for yard waste, so a lot of that just gets uh, mixed in with other landfill. So you can uh, let that dry out, for, I think, a few days um, just to kill off any seeds that might be there. Um, and then you can use some of that recycled yard waste um, as some additional compost for your, for your parkway, which helps you to recycle and then also helps your plants. Part of the whole circle of life type piece. It's a great way to have it. Well, we are coming up on 6.30 in just a moment here. Um, we're gonna take into account all the talk about needing more resources and what those are and figure out how we can support uh, Larissa and Tina in getting those to you. 
Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And stay tuned. We will be hosting another workshop in the next month, I believe. So yes, stay tuned for a notification about that. Be another hope to see you there. And then you have a bunch coming up too, right? You've got all kinds of things they can participate in. Yeah, we also have an Earth Day workshop coming up on Earth Day. Oh, uh, Larissa, do you have more details on that? Yeah, so that's um, going to be the entire uh, city of Long Beach is going to be hosting um, with some of our other departments. So we have um, Energy Resources, the Environmental Services Bureau, um, the uh, Office of Sustainability. Um, and so we haven't started advertising for it yet, um, but look out on our social media calendars. We should be advertising it um, within at least the next couple of weeks. And those are just going to be some workshops for Long Beach residents who want to make Earth Day every day um, and just teaching some sustainable tips on how to live a more uh, green life. So um, we'll just look out for that. I believe the date is going to be on the 20th of April, so Earth Day. Um, so if anybody has any other questions about that or just uh, interested in other ways to save water or other landscaping tips or anything about sustainability, contact Tina or I. Um, our names are on the uh, Parkway website. Um, we can help you out with anything at the water department or if you need help contacting a different department or not quite sure how you can get your conservation or sustainability questions answered, we can point you in the right direction. Well, thank you very much and have a good evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.